it's not the most uh, straightforward path, certainly, that I took to get to teaching this stuff. I did start out wanting to be a teacher when I was in middle school. I had some really good science teachers, art teachers. I wanted to do that. I knew I wanted to be a teacher from a young age. Uh, I definitely did not plan on teaching coding or web development. I wanted to be a science teacher, an art teacher, but that was like seventh, eighth grade cult, and then things kind of turned into a million different directions. I went into music for a while. I wanted to do off-Broadway theater. <laughs> um, I wanted to do art. The entire way through college and some of my first early uh, jobs, I was doing tutoring. I was teaching, sort of teaching, you know, one-on-one -on -one or leading study groups or working at the Student Learning Center at the, the school that I went to. Uh, and then I got into programming actually at a relatively young age, thanks to my dad. He brought a little robotics kit home when I was somewhere in middle school. I had done some programming. I didn't really consider it a career. Uh, fast forward to the end of college. I had done some computer science. I was kind of at a loss for exactly what to do next. I just started doing more programming and, and took it more seriously instead of just a, you know, a hobby to build little projects or, or fun uh, robots or art pieces. I tried to do it in a more professional way. And then eventually I, I moved to San Francisco and I realized all my friends were going to these boot camps. There's tons of opportunities for combining teaching uh, along with coding. So I kind of knew I wanted to teach from a really young age, but I didn't pursue it as a career until I realized that there was a way to combine teaching with programming. And even that started out as just TAing a course part-time at night and then weekends and then doing a full boot camp as a teaching assistant just to see if I was, I mean, well, they wouldn't hire me. <laughs> as a full instructor first. I had to work my way up and then eventually uh, leading my own classes and starting a boot camp, and then doing it online. So it's been a very long journey. Not, none of it was planned, let's put it that way. The most common pitfall by far is trying to learn too many things at once or switching what you're learning from one week to the next or one course to the next especially with web development and with coding in general, but especially web development, there's such a, a fragmented environment, just so many different languages, different frameworks and libraries, and they're constantly changing and things are being updated and coming sort of in and out of uh, uh, different trends at any given point. It's exhausting to keep up with, even as like a, an experienced developer, it's really tiring and many companies will give their, their own employees like a day a week just to improve your skills and stay up to date. But when you're starting out and you don't have any skills yet, uh, it's way, way, way too much to try and stay on top of all the changes, try and master you know, five different frameworks at once. It's tempting because a, a lot of students think it will broaden their, their job prospects or they can apply to you know, different roles if they know Python, or if they know, let's say, React and Angular and Vue. But the reality is that First of all, it's highly unlikely you're going to become very good at all three of those, you know, in a short amount of time. It's your time is way better spent focusing on one and trying to master one. You don't have to pick one that, you know, you, you stay with for your entire life. It's not life or death. You can pick something, pursue it for a couple of months and then decide to change or, you know, apply for a job. And on that job, you'll likely have to pick something up anyway uh, and learn something new. So I, I, I see a lot of students at the very beginning who have a list of every technology they need to learn and usually they could pare it down to like two or three different things instead of 10. But that's a hard one to, to sell to students because they are constantly bombarded with different blog posts or different you know, YouTube videos telling them that they need to learn X or Y or here's the, the top trending framework of 2021. You have like voices from everywhere telling you that you need to continue to learn all these new things. But my advice is pick one thing I mean, I wouldn't pick something, you know, from 20 years ago that nobody uses, but pick one thing, whether it's JavaScript and React or JavaScript and Angular, or you're learning Python and Django. There are differences, but pick something and stick with it and wait to pivot or wait to, to learn something new until you feel like you've, if not mastered, but you are comfortable with uh, the first tool that you learned. And the last thing I would say is the, the language I first learned to code in all the way back when I was in middle school, this robotics thing my dad brought home was Visual Basic. I have not touched that 
ever in a professional capacity. Never used it on a job or you know in the classroom or uh, really probably haven't touched it in almost 20 years. That was what I learned to code on. It doesn't matter. Nobody asked me that. It never comes up. Once you learn the basics, you're going to learn something new anyway. And things just change. Things have, what I teach right now compared to what I taught five, ten years ago, completely different. And the same goes for what people are writing. You know, a developer ten years ago versus that same person today, they're probably going to be writing something entirely different. So you got to get used to it, but don't uh, prematurely switch back and forth. That's my main advice. Well, the course has one main aim, which is to take uh, people from all different backgrounds and get them jobs, uh, software engineering jobs, and, and get them to do that from, I wouldn't say the comfort of their own homes, but from their own homes or their own lives, and not force students to come into a, you know, a classroom or an office every day, but still bring the, the rigor and the, the academics, if you want to call it that, from uh, an in-person boot camp program and just move it online. So that's the goal, to get students jobs. Uh, and so far, it's, it's going well. So as far as designing the curriculum, um, it's mostly, I mean, it all started from my experience teaching in person uh, and designing in-person curriculum, uh, which is kind of where all my online courses start. In the online world, you're kind of just, at least a lot of the courses I've done, it's a one-way sort of relationship. I will record something or teach something for some hypothetical audience that I hope is there, but there's never much, I mean, there's like bug reports and, you know, discussions from the students, but I'm not interacting with them. So it's hard to just come up with curriculum and test it in that environment. So usually what I do is teach it in person first and see what works, what doesn't work. Uh, a lot of the time things don't work. And then from there, uh, try and take whatever sort of experience we had in the classroom and bring it online and, and Often things need to be adjusted, you know, in terms of duration, um, we'll break things up, we might need more exercises. We definitely design things differently for the online experience, but uh, it all starts with what we've seen in the classroom and what works and doesn't work. It wasn't like we were starting from scratch, I'll, I'll put it that way. We had 10 years of teaching this stuff in person and, and hopefully by then knowing what works and what gets students jobs and what doesn't get them jobs. I think having some some form of a mentor, whether it's an official, actual mentor, or a, uh, just a friend that you have, um, you know, that that knows how to code or has experience coding, having somebody who is not just your your peer or a classmate that you can bounce things off of and, and get advice from, but also ask questions to is uh, really, really beneficial. Whether you're you know, in an online course or you're just trying to teach yourself to program, having an official mentor program uh, certainly is new for me, and especially online. That's been a really big plus. Without fail, it's the thing that gets the best feedback from students whenever I talk to them. Having a consistent, just sustained relationship with somebody over the course of months who watches you grow, but also is able to you know, coach you in different directions, provide feedback, uh, and often provide actual coaching and maybe a bit of encouragement when needed. <laughs> Those are the sort of things that make a big difference online. It's definitely uh, different than it was 10 years ago. As far as being a bootcamp grad, there's a lot of bootcamp grads these days. That's just the reality of it. Um, it's not enough. Uh, there's a ton of openings, but at one point, uh, if you had skills and, and you know you could fill out an application saying that you knew JavaScript or back then Ruby or whatever the language was, um, you might be able to get an interview pretty easily. These days, there's just competition. There's you know a lot of students who are, who are trying to break into this industry. And that sounds negative, and I guess it is to some extent. It'd be easier, right, if, if you could just uh, you know show up and get a job without trying. But what really matters is being able to demonstrate your skills before the interview. So being able to uh, have a portfolio is probably the single most important thing, and it's one of the more sometimes painful parts of being a, a boot camp student or the boot camp experience, having to 
really focus on coming up with projects and, and completing them um, and making them look good and have some polish and really having them speak for your own skills uh, as other people see them. It's really the, you know, the one thing somebody's gonna look at first. So that's what we, I've always placed a big emphasis on, but in person, online, it probably is even more important having some, some way to stand out, something to show for yourself, um, something that ideally speaks a bit about your interests or your, you know, your personality, your sense of humor, whatever it is. We're, we're not asking students to, to you know, create the next startup or change the world with their projects but do something that proves to the world that you know, you, know, you know your stuff, you know your skills, you've got HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Python, that sort of thing. Um, so we ask students to spend a lot of time on their portfolio, and that's really the most important piece. I wish there was a, like a very easy answer to that. Even some of the most talented ones, the ones who end up getting really, really high paying, exciting jobs at companies they like, imposter syndrome gets kind of thrown about sometimes too easily or applied to every situation. Sometimes, you know, you are an imposter. <laughs> when you're learning, you have to start somewhere. You kind of have to fake certain things and you've got to be Googling and, and like you're going to be uncertain and unsure and you're not going to be an expert. And it takes a long time to be an expert, but that's not a problem. Um, I think that's where the a lot of students get freaked out is, is it feels weird. It feels very different from most disciplines that you pick up. In programming, you're really not expected to memorize much. You're not expected to know answers immediately. And that feels like you don't know things um, because you can't recall something immediately. But there's a difference and it takes time to get comfortable researching or honestly copying and pasting, looking up old code, uh, collaborating with people, finding answers online, getting unstuck, debugging. Those are all skills that in the moment feel like you don't have skills, um, but those are the skills that you actually need. Imposter syndrome is real and it's, a, it's something that uh, plagues a lot of students who, when they're starting out, but I think part of you know, you, you hear about imposter syndrome with programming probably the most, more so than a lot of other disciplines, um, because there are concrete ways in other disciplines. If there, there's tests you can take, and if you get 100% on a test, then you know you know the stuff. You're not an imposter. Um, but certainly com going up against students who have computer science degrees can be a stressful experience. Uh, going through the interview process, uh, there probably will be pain and failure at some point along the way, like that's all very normal. In a boot camp, in person or online, we're trying to take a lot of learning and cram it into a couple of months. So it is overwhelming, it can be stressful, it can be exhausting, um, and there can be a lot of emotions mixed up with it. It's supposed to be hopefully a positive experience and in the end, you know, things work out, but it can be tough and in those situations, it's very easy to sort of question yourself or, you know, have moments of doubt, but that's also what mentorship is for. And, and it's one of the most important aspects of having a mentor is that they can sort of be there, not quite as a therapist, but as somebody who can, who can tell you like, it's okay that you don't remember that, or it's okay that you couldn't come up with this solution immediately. Um, or maybe there are times they, they tell you, you know, it's not okay that you don't remember that, but having somebody there who has, who works, who's actually, you know, not just a teacher like me, but somebody who is a, uh, a developer day to day who can affirm to you what matters and what doesn't matter um, really helps crack down on some of the, the doubt that creeps in. When we're putting together a, a curriculum, um, there is a lot of flexibility in the specific uh, frameworks or tools that we teach, but there are at least three things that have to be there for any web development curriculum, which is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. At a minimum, those three have to be covered, and, and JavaScript specifically is, is going to take up a huge chunk of any boot camp, any curriculum. Um, but then you have some choice as, a, as an instructor, as a, somebody who's developing the curriculum. If you, you can include uh, something like Node, if you want to teach some backend or teach Python, which is what I prefer to do these days. Uh, I like to teach students more than more than one language and sort of force them to go through the experience of learning a second language after the first one, which sometimes uh, seems stressful or, you know, uh, it's not always necessary. You could stick with JavaScript, um, 
it, but it, it provides the best sort of results, the best uh, experience for a student at the end of the day to be able to leave with two languages mastered. Having that experience makes the third one a million times easier. The fourth one, it, it just keeps getting easier. So once you get past that first one, it, it just improves from there. But in terms of the actual tools that we teach, whether it's uh, online with Springboard or the, the curriculum that I teach in person, we can't get around JavaScript, we can't avoid it. Then you have a choice between teaching frameworks like React or Vue or Angular, um, which most boot camps choose to teach one of those. And recently React has certainly been the most popular uh, and it's been that way for a little while, but it, it's honestly, it kind of changes and, and uh, they're, they're, I'd say they're pretty equal in their market share these days and most people are learning React uh, and it's certainly the easiest one to pick up. It's one that is uh, highly supported, lots of conferences, a big community around it, lots of documentation, tutorials, courses. It's, it's uh, kind of the good first framework for a reason, uh, not to knock anything like Vue or Angular at all and other boot camps do teach those. Uh, and, and we have students who are working jobs in you know, writing Angular every day with TypeScript, for example, or uh, writing Vue every day, or writing some other language we don't even cover entirely. Um, but that's kind of where we're trying to get students, is that we want them to finish a course so that they can go work anywhere and you know, have mastered a couple of languages and tools, but be able to pick up whatever they need. So I, I know a lot of students look at curriculum and they, they care about curriculum. They have a list of, you know, this boot camp doesn't cover uh, Angular, so I don't want to go, or this boot camp doesn't cover, um, you know, Vue, so I don't want to attend. But the reality is that it's going to change. It, even within the, month, the couple of months that you're taking a course, things are going to come and go, and they're not going to disappear, but there's probably going to be a year from now, some other framework that's the up and coming trendy framework. The, if we do our job right, students will be able to learn that on their own or be able to pick that up or get a job in that next framework, whatever it is. So that's kind of my goal. Uh, I know it, a lot of students care about the, the specific buzzwords, the, the frameworks, you know, where jobs are right now. And of course, our, everyone's interests are aligned in making sure students can get jobs after a boot camp, right? We're not gonna teach uh, some language from 15 years ago uh, just because it's fun we teach things that we think and we know uh, students will be able to get jobs with. But the overarching goal is that students should then be able to get a job in any sort of language, any programming, any web, web framework, whatever it is, uh, because of the experience that they build up in you know, six months of curriculum.